Hello, I guess I will run the meeting today. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're getting the contributor hours back up and running. Um, thanks for your patience while we've been figuring out some things from an operational standpoint behind the scenes. Um, so I'd put out, um, you know, we have our, our form. These are going to be weekly now again, um, and there will be events for them every week. Um, on that event, I've attached the Google form where you can submit um, agenda topics or any questions that you have. Um, and I will do my best to communicate those before. Um, we didn't have any for this week yet. So I had just put out one that I had seen from Addison um, around claims and proofs. And uh, OK, I see Addison, you've added some items. So I guess we can just do kind of like a loose, more informal agenda here. Um, and then week over week, guys, if you remember, I will send out reminders earlier than I did uh, today to add items to the agenda so that we can have more focused talks every week. So um, where is the best place to jump in? Now recording. All good. All good. Well, um, Addison, Blair, um, thank you for joining us. Um, I will not be able to answer some of the questions you have, but I have brought Joe, who is definitely qualified to do so. Um, so before, are, is everyone okay with us just jumping into the uh, items that uh, Addison has added to the agenda? Is there anything else that anyone wants to add before we get to those questions? No? All right, then let's just jump in. Um, so Addison, um, do you want to elaborate on the question that you have um, about comment and handle relay? Yes. Um, so essentially there's a comment in the handle relay function that's like store proof before execution because the order in which the proofs are stored matters because the proof is linked to the previous proof, except that doesn't make any sense because proofs can be composed into a claim or proof um, in any order as long as it's consistent between the two. And within like the evidence store structure, there's no like linkage between proofs. So I'm not sure like what the nature of that comment is. It's linked in the uh, um, core dev chat. Yep, I'll share that here in the channel in case anyone wants to check it out. Joe, have you seen this comment that Addison is talking about? Um, you said you linked to the actual point in the core dev channel of where it's happening in the code, Addison. Yeah, yeah. just click the link uh, sent by Jessica, oh, okay. and then click yeah, and then click up, and then I posted the GitHub link. Yeah. Um. It's kind of, it's like Andrew wrote the comment like two years ago, so I don't even know if okay. I have to answer. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I don't quite know why. I don't quite know why. I don't actually know if, if moving this to execute then store, um, would it's a good question um because i'm the thing that is i'm not exactly sure about is what happens with um essentially relays coming through asynchronously um it is interesting that we are storing before the error though um because at, at that point, why I'm, I'm assuming where your logic is going here is why are we essentially storing around proofs for relays that aren't valid? Um, I mean, I didn't really have like a point. I was just reading through all of this and I saw that comment. I was like, that doesn't really make much sense because um, I've just been thinking about ways to like optimize the storage um, since I think there's a lot of redundant computation there. I mean, there's not, I didn't have a specific purpose. I was just curious to why that was the why that was written there, since it doesn't make a lot of sense. But yeah, storing the proof before validating it is curious as well. I think, I think when they say because it corresponds to the previous relay, I think it. I think that's just a clarification of what we're storing. I don't. I don't think that 
that because is a Y, so to speak. So we're storing the proof on the relay. Um, yeah, but I'm just wondering, yeah, like, I mean, like, like, in order, like, if you wanted to decrease latency, like, why not store the proof after you return the relay? Like, that's kind of what I'm wondering. But it specifically yeah, says a, because it corresponds to the previous relay, but like, I don't see where in the evidence store that there's any linkage between uh, relay proofs. So, I don't know. I think. Andrew, I mean, Andrew wrote it, so maybe he has the answer, but I don't think he's here. He's not, but I've Believe noted. It. Oh, go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, yeah, you're right. Andrew's probably the best person who can answer if, if this is just how it was written, so to speak, because uh, my gut's actually leaning that that's what it is here. Um, but Andrew's probably the person to um, follow this up with. Yeah. Yeah, I reached, I tag, I don't know, he's, I, he's, I know he's busy. I tagged him a few times in the channel, but if Jessica could squeeze an answer out of him for this, that would be much appreciated. I will do my best. Yeah, because like I'm in this, in the handle relay, there's a, the handle relay function and the validate function are curious because there's also a whole bunch of errors in the validate function that there are some people who are not returning or skipping over the validation. Um, and I think there's some optimization we can do there both for latency and also for quality of service. So that's why I'm seeing these questions because I think with some small changes to the client, um, we can reduce gateway manipulation and also help performance a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, it, it it's really weird in my opinion that we're storing and then and then if there's an error, we just return out a nil at that point. Why are we storing? Um, the, I mean, that's just a small one, but there's there's I I yeah, I'm I'm interested to what the answer is. Uh, I know that you have a, another a few other points to hit here. Yeah, um, I guess my next. Let me see what I wrote. Uh, the next one I wanted to ask, I guess this is probably another Andrew question, but how do chain halts arise and what's caused them in the past? Like I know they arise from a different state route um, occurring in proposed blocks amongst the validators, but I'm not sure like what things in the past have caused the chain halts on the network. So, so yeah. essentially, what what have been the causes of where the state routes become inconsistent? Yeah. I believe what happened this last time, and don't don't hold me directly to this, but what I believe was the case here is that um, a chunk of validators went offline during the after the pre-commit stage and before the commit stage, and so um, something about that made it so that um, when they came back up, they're not going to start back over the mid stage they're I, i'm not sure if they dropped off completely i'm not sure if they came back up but it was basically having that invalid pre-commit data um i believe it was having that invalid pre-commit data being propagated across the network and then never actually used in the next commit phase because those validators went offline i believe that's what this last one was yeah i think that makes sense the ones i'm more and more interested about are the ones that happened like in may of last year some, if my if my recollections are calling correctly, around that time we were having issues with just locks not processing. Um, just essentially, um, I think I know there was definitely one in May that had, um, like the mempool getting overflowed, um, too many transactions to process in the block, and um, just. Because some mempools were getting overflowed and overwritten and others weren't, there was just no way to reach consensus about was what was actually in those mempools. Yeah. Cool. Um, anything else on chain halts or do you want to talk about the uh, re uh, reward of a proof endpoint? 
No, I think that's good. Again, like if if Andrew, if you can get a hold of Andrew, I think he might have some good insights there as well. Right. Uh, I think I, just, I think for the the chain halt one, uh, we could probably tap to any anyone who has worked on the protocol. Um, yeah. I, I think in that I, I think the first one we probably need Andrew, but I think in the the second one, um, just for some other examples of where chain halts had happened in the past, I think um, I think anyone from the protocol should suffice there. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Irving or Otto would have great historical context. Exactly, yeah. This next one, Addison, is a question that I've also been kind of asking myself for a little bit of maybe not even, because um, right now I see that you have it as just essentially we give a proof, like what was that rewarded amount? Um the question that I think I've been rolling back to is, can we just get a way to link a proof to the corresponding claim? Um, because fundamentally, I think that actually ends up serving the same purpose because um, actually it might not. So I might jump in on that to you. Um, would um, I guess it, because, it does save the serm. It say I guess it saves the serve same purpose so i'm not sure if it's like as good because then you still have to like check the number of relays in the claim and then do the appropriate multiplications i was thinking for this you could either pass in a proof tx hash or um like a block and then it'll give you uh essentially the number of relays served the total reward and who it went to um and the reasons why i think we should do this um, as you probably also know, Joe, is like we have put a, we as the community have put a tremendous amount of effort into like indexing these rewards. Like Pocket Scan has their own indexer, which unfortunately is closed source. Um, we've also made our own indexer. Coders made their own indexer. And it's not easy to make these because every time there's a change to the protocol, you have to make an, uh, the same change to your indexer. And then also you have to worry about getting it 100% accurate. And we have been unable to get our own to be 100% accurate. It's like off by plus or minus like 0.1%, um, depending on the block. And so I think if there is an endpoint within the protocol, that wouldn't, like it wouldn't even be that complicated to, to implement because you just have to run through reward go, depending on um, like the, with whatever information. Um, that the proof has. And when you're in reward go, like you have the context of the protocol, you're using the same precision that it's doing. And so it's basically guaranteed to be 100% accurate. Um, and then building an indexer based upon that endpoint is like trivial. Um, um, hold on, I'm stopping you here because you, you threw in a detail that I kind of needed. Uh, reward go, uh, is that under is that under nodes? I'm not sure. I think I'm, it might be under types, but I don't know if that's off of my okay. head. I, I've been banging my head against the wall to just try to um, figure out how to, um, because yeah, your, your problem of you run through the historical rewards, you notice that there's like a, a certain like small percentage off. I've been running into that myself. Uh, it's been because like fundamentally for how you can index the proofs and claims on chain right now, uh, without having the actual client context, the problem is you're left to assume which claim matches to which proof. Um, and so yeah. the amount of relay served, because there are some claims that go un, unproved, it, it ends up being that you're guessing that this is the, the corresponding claim for that proof. But um, yeah, if you could point me to reward um, where exactly you're thinking with this, that that would be great. Okay, cool. I'm on my phone right now, so I'll do it like in the next hour or two. I'll send it in the chat. But also like what Sandwalker did is they built, they modified the protocol so that every time it would sync a block, when it was minting the new coins, it would add that as like a row entry to an, an alternate database. And so I think we could just do something similar, like simulate, uh, simulate whatever function. I need to double check the name that 
um, it runs every time like a block's validated, just pass in like the proof information. Um, and that would basically be a hundred percent accurate reward. And I think for someone like, like someone like Andrew or Luis or any of the, the protocol devs that already have like good context into everything would be able to implement this like pretty easily. And I think um, like the, the amount of time it would take them compared to the amount of time everyone else spends trying to get this information is pretty high. Yeah, so are you are you thinking uh, your intuition here is that it's under keep uh, nodes keeper reward go and then reward for relays? Is that does that sound um, right? I know that you're not necessarily looking at it, but yes, I think yeah, I think reward go is where the like the actual calculation is done, and then there's some function I forget the name where it like actually does the proof claim matching, and then the reward go. Like calculation is a subset of that. I'm like eighty percent sure that's how it works, but I need to double check. Either this directly or the proof claim matching, I think would be. Uh, I, I think both of them are exactly where we need to be headed, and I've. Yeah, yeah, this is this is something that like in the past week I have been digging around for. So I'm glad you brought it up because, yeah, the the problem really is is that there is no way for the current context of what you're getting without running the client to have absolute certainty of what that what that proof and claim matches so to speak yeah exactly so yeah i know uh jessica is becoming more involved in like uh management of like features and implementation of the protocol so this is something that could be implemented that would be i think very beneficial to everyone i hear you yeah um i saw that you had added this to d work as a community yeah. suggestion to potentially be turned into a bounty like is this something that like hypothetically if it was turned into a bounty that could be done by the community or is this something that we should take internally um i mean it's possible to do um like, yeah, I mean, there's people that definitely can do it. Um, like, Jorge or Pocketblade could probably do it. Pierre could probably do it. Um, but I think everyone's very um, busy with their own things. And I think, like, the time it would take for an external person to do it compared to, like, someone who already has worked on the protocol before is pretty drastic. I think for, um, like, Andrew or um, someone like that, it would take them, like, a very short amount of time to do. So internally might be better. Um, but you could so make it a bounty in. and see what happens. I'm actually going to jump in with a bit of perspective here. I think that it, this really is a low lift, and my intuition is that it's a low lift, and it's a need that we've had for since the start, I'm going to say. Um, I think keeping it internally allows us to um, make sure that our specs and kind of client libraries are also updated in sync with this, so that way... Sure. Uh, it's not just like that one level that's going out, but it, like that consistent level um, where as we roll out kinds of these quality of life changes, it's important that um, they're rolled out throughout our stack instead of just um, where they come from. And I think I think the while we could probably get an external person to do the protocol level work, I think it's important that we kind of bundle this all together in one big package. That makes sense. Okay, I will definitely talk to uh, Otto about that implementation and the prioritization of it. I even, honestly, this is, I was going to say, this is a blocker um, for me as well. So, would you like to upon how hard it is? <laughs> depending upon how hard it is, I'm happy to, um, if, like, I'm happy to work with the protocol team on this if that's a, to do it but really for for making any kind of client interface this is this is kind of a must that we can at least surface this information outwardly great well i think as like some next steps like you said um if you can connect with addison about getting some of the specifics about um where these functions are in the code um and at least helping us set up the spec um then i could talk to Otto about the implementation yeah that sounds that sounds great awesome yep okay. sounds good
All right, great. Um, awesome. So uh, I know Addison, I know you have to drop in like seven minutes and you have one more question mm -hmm. um, around the kind of underlying cryptography of proofs and claims. Um, is this, do, do we want to get into that now or do you think there's not enough time? I mean, we can go as far as you'd like. Yeah, I don't think there's enough um, time, but also I think like Andrew has kind of only <laughs> one that I really... <laughs> Yes, sir. I was going to say, I think Dan might be better for this. I know that he had a, he had done, he had a piece out at one point specifically about diving through um, the, our proof claim life cycle and how the cryptography works under the hood. Um, so I think if, if there's anyone who already has written informative resources on this, I think it is probably uh, Dan Olshansky. Okay. Yeah, he sent. I'll look up. Uh, I saw it, but I didn't dig into it. Might have been an infracon. Uh, it might have either been an infracon piece, or it might have been a, a conference talk where he dove deep on this. But uh, he's very likely the person. Like the the point of reaching out to him is like that information's already there and uh, well explained. I do think it's worth highlighting better, though. Okay, I'll find that then. Thanks. I'll look for it too, Addison, um, and I'll talk to Olshansky about it, and then we can uh, put that in a more public place. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah, maybe we should get like a contributor, like Google Drive folder or something. Um, that would be helpful. Um, great. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, noted on two of these questions, if I can't get um, answers from Andrew, um, you know, I will see if maybe he can attend next week um, or in one of the upcoming weeks so we can have a, a more, you know, a discussion about it rather than just like here's the text that he sent back so i will let you know either way cool awesome um we have a couple more agenda items that were uh submitted by pocket blade um he's not able to join us today but before we go into those um i wanted to see pause does anyone have any questions that they'd like to jump in and ask now No? Okay. I just have a question, just like a statement, observation, um, state of things. I think there's a lot of like extra work that's being done due to like lack of information and insight into the core protocol team. Um, like for example, there's lots of issues with the gateway with like the invalid block height errors and all sorts of like errors that don't really make a lot of sense that are kind of a result of like a protocol that was, is not fully compatible with the gateway. Um, and then also like with reward indexers and this endpoint, um, all of those are things that could benefit a very tremendously from like a core team that's more communicative and sharing of how things work. When you're talking about like the lack of information, is it like a granularity problem or is it like a pure visibility problem like where you want like a single source of truth where you can go there and kind of see the progress or like how how can we kind of solve for for that like in a more asynchronous way possibly i think a lot of it is just like pure communication like i've heard mm -hmm. from people even on the pocket team that they're kind of unable to get answers Um, because they have all the knowledge and it's not documented well. Um, and so I think improving, I mean, maybe not documentation at this stage, um, since kind of the focus for that should be in V1, but at least being communicative about how things work, um, both internally and externally, I think would be a tremendous help. Yeah, and uh, I, I... I fundamentally agree. Um, this, uh, the the thing that I've been really kind of pushing hard for in whatever time I can find Addison is just this lack of clear, in my opinion, that if we are expecting people to be interacting with our protocol, we need it clearly defined how you interact with the protocol. And that's something that we haven't had. Um, and that, that's something that I've, I've really pushed hard for, um, finding a lot of the discriminated types that you can't actually define in Go, finding a lot of those features with bringing just the data RPC spec up to date was was a first step. But then once you have that full type spec out, 
to realize that, oh, there's no way to correlate proofs to claims. And if there's no way to correlate proofs to claims, there's no way to actually index relays without running a client. And we don't want people to do that. And um, my goal was to have the first official release of the, the Python client out on um, this week. Uh, that blocker has basically been me diving for this last bit of reward accuracy in there. Um, but uh, the goal with that is to push out not just uh, an RPC interface that's consistent, well-typed, and well-explained, and not hiding any details of types in nested objects, but also uh, to kind of put out a flattened table schema so that people building indexers aren't rolling their own and that as a community we're all operating under like the same single source of truth uh, because when debates start happening around rewards and when debates start happening about like fairness if everyone's using their own homegrown indexer there's no real great way for us to kind of come to consensus on at least what the data even is uh, let alone the like legitimacy of the analyses so um yeah that's that's really been a, a big push. Uh, got a little rocks in just swapping around what's going on behind the scenes, but um, that's something that I I truly believe is not something. It's something that is basically my number one priority. So, yeah, I think it's like the fundamental a fundamental problem that's resulted in an inordinate amount of work for. Um, almost everybody along the whole stack from node runners to analytics individuals like pocket scan um, and then also even like the portal itself um, so i think alleviating that would be very beneficial to everyone um, but those individuals are not on this call so but if that message could be resounded i think that would be good You know, it sounds like you and Joe are kind of encountering a similar blocker um, around like this sort of some of some of this visibility. I mean, I know like Addison, I talked to you and Pocket Blade a little bit too about just kind of like general operations and visibility and 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 um, you know with the community. Um, one of my goals in in the upcoming um, you know month or so is to start doing more public sprint reviews um, for V zero, so we can say, hey, this is what we've done. This is what we're planning on doing next, and give you know people like you the opportunity to chime in and say hey look like i really think we need to prioritize this rewards endpoint and here's why um this will reduce a lot of noise etc um so i'm hoping to uh add that layer of visibility and uh kind of like ongoing uh you know back and forth communication um and so we all can kind of feel like one team um working on the same page um and moving in the same direction um so definitely noted about about that blocker um and like i said i will you know be talking to joe about about the spec of that and talking to otto about the prioritization um you know right now we're very heads down on getting non-custodial back out the door um and we're you know kind of re-evaluating the roadmap and putting things together and um i've added a ticket for this already um so it's definitely on our radar and um i do appreciate your feedback and for what it's worth i agree with you as well um please keep giving me feedback about the process and, and how we can uh, make the communication uh better because i agree there's a lot of redundancies and um an issue that we have too is that um, you, you kind of said it before, there are individuals who are, um, who, who have certain knowledge, like we can't answer this question without Andrew. Um, and that, that, that is a pain point and a problem because if Andrew falls off the face of the earth tomorrow, what are we going to do at that point? You know, so, um, increasing, um, even just internal transparency, as far as knowledge transfer goes, the B0 and V1 protocol teams are now working on coming together and working in the same sort of agile processes. And so I'm hoping that will improve things as well. Um, it won't be immediate, but over the course of time. Oh, Addison is typing. Thanks, Addison. Talk to you soon. I'll keep you posted as well. We'll be back next week with more updates. <laughs> All right. So let's move on for the second half of this. Um, we got a couple of questions from Pocket Blade, like I said. Um, so I will look at the first one. Um, these are actually more, not so much technical questions about how things work, um, but questions about uh, you know the core developers' thoughts on some changes that Pocket Blade is proposing. So 
Let me go ahead and share these out here in the chat with everyone. So he shared a link to an issue that he had opened on GitHub here. And he is wondering um, everyone's thoughts on increasing validator security in general. Um, so he was wondering how we can ensure the network stays secure. Um, you know, there was a 20% validator um, like had popped, what was he saying? Popped out of blue? Popped out of view? I don't know what that means. Two days ago. To do. Okay. <sighs> yeah, I think that there was an issue. Yeah, where there were some validators that had gone offline um, with Easy to Stake a couple of weeks, uh, a couple weeks ago, and so I think this is what his proposal is in uh, reaction to. So I think he just wants to encourage a kind of general discussion around, you know, the thoughts on increasing validator security. And I know everyone's just kind of seeing this proposal for the first time. Joe, have you seen this issue already? Or is this completely new to you as well? Um, I'm just giving it a quick read right now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Everyone could take a few minutes to catch up. Yeah, essentially that, you know, servicers have a lot of stake and there's a small portion of actors who are, you know, basically yeah. the key de decision makers um, and the gatekeepers. I, yeah, this is a, this is an interesting question. Um, and it's, it really, uh, what, what it is for everyone essentially is kind of asking if, there's any possibility of, of throwing in a delegation uh, layer so that instead of relying on, I guess, node runners to adapt to the market incentives uh, for security, if they don't prove to do so, that perhaps there's a potential to secure it through um, a, a delegation type system that you see in other proof of stake networks where um, there's more at stake and it costs more to um, kind of overtake the network uh, where, where this starts to get difficult is uh, this is not a low level lift for, for work that would have to be done. Um, there's, I, I know that there's been some just like spitballing about potentially um, having it so that, nodes can delegate their stake to a validator in a one-off way, but then this adds this complexity of of essentially kind of merging two message types into one. Um, if you wanted to do it with its own operation, you're then splitting, you're essentially needing to create two new message types, and then without all of your servicers in the, uh, in the validation pool, uh, the question there is, can you even do like delegated rewards in that sense? And the answer to that isn't very clear. Um, it might only be that you're going to do a, a split of block proposal rewards and only to validators instead of being able to do it network wide. And that, that starts to create the system where validators get a bunch of privileges over servicers. And uh, while having a bigger stake in validators is important for the the security of the network, it, it starts to then make validators a almost a better another step of a better class citizen above servicers and that has its its trade-offs there. Um yeah it's a it's an interesting proposal. Um I do I do think means of increasing validator security are things that we do need to discuss, but um it just feels like the idea of delegation feels like a heavy lift. Um, yeah, the scope does seem seem very large for sure. Um, when I still don't understand this comment that he made, twenty percent validator popped 
out of blue. I guess he means out of the blue. But I don't know what he means popped out. He said one to two days ago. Oh, um, basically a single group uh, took over 20% of the validator pool. Uh, ah. just like that. Yeah, so there's, there is a need for increasing the kind of capital that's locked up in the validator pool. Um, and I think the interest here is what mechanisms do we have to kind of, kind of help um, facilitate that. Right, to ensure the ratios stay secure and healthy. Yeah, yeah. Basically that, um, I don't know if he mentions it in here. I think it is right in there that we're only really secured with 10% of the stake that we otherwise would have if we didn't need to do a validator servicer split, that 90% of the stake is locked up in servicers, only 10% is locked up in validators. And what that means is that... Uh, group of servicers with enough stake if they wanted to could just unstake throw that into a validator and right. then if you get 67 percent of that validation control uh it's basically they're running the chain yeah is there anyone else that has any thoughts on this even just like a pro like what is the? I joined a bit late, so can someone summarize what the question was? Hey, Olshansky. Yeah. Um. So we're talking about an RFP that was submitted by Pocket Blade. It's linked out in the uh, channel voice channel chat. Um. Basically, he wants to add a delegation to uh you know to the network for uh to increase validator security. Um. A couple of days ago, there was a validator. Um. There was a, a pool of validators that uh basically became twenty percent of the network out of the blue. And so he's seeing some concerns about, um, you know, especially now with the, I guess the incentive of the stake weighted rewards of people, you know, massively becoming validators and then, you know, a potential single actor having like a majority control and running the network essentially. Okay, um, at a high level, kind of delegated staking definitely sounds like a good idea, I think. I mean, the, the issue here is very much understanding what the scope of work is going to be um, and the impact overall. I like the idea, but from my perspective, I would have to do the technical due diligence to figure out how much work it'll actually be. So that can be done as part of the RFP, um, which I haven't looked at and might have been done already. I think that would be the best step there. We, so, yeah, we. I think a little context on this RFP is it's not, it's not necessarily focused on delegation as a solution. I think it's kind of just a call out for discussing potential solutions to increase really the the amount of stake that is protecting the validator pool. Delegation feels like the nicest answer, but if it's not. I think the goal here is to to bounce back to potential other answers as well. Yeah, he's he's thrown out some other ideas that are more quote unquote low hanging fruit, like increasing the validator count, which might have other you know implications that we're not aware of, um, or raising the pip twenty two staking bins. Um, could be some alternatives to. I mean, we, we talked about this before you joined on Olshansky. The delegation is like a huge huge scope but we could start investigating that as well as you know validating or invalidating like the increase of the validator count for example okay yeah so in terms of increasing the validator count there's also a balance between you know more focus on v0 and v1 with v1 uh we're working on it where there's going to be no cap on the validator count which is not something even tendermint or the cosmos gate has right now which is what we're trying to build um, there are potential issues around block size and other things. If we were to increase the validator count as is, um, again, still an option. We'd have to do the math and figure out where that caps out from both the P2P and consensus level. Yeah. Um, so that, that is the validator count, uh, idea, putting that there, uh, regarding the validator count popping, uh, does that mean falling off the network 
or something else. I think he meant popping up. Like he was looking at like the spread of validators and servicers of validators across the network. And there was like one that popped up that had like 20% and it was like out of nowhere seeming. And I think he's like, well, what if one day well, someone pops up and they have 67% control? Yeah, this is definitely an issue with um, any Byzantine fault tolerant uh, blockchain. <laughs> um, that if you have enough capital and you can uh, overtake 67% of the network, uh, you can yeah. essentially fork it. Um, and yeah, I think I would have to look at the RFP to provide a better solutions so, than the alternative proposals were. Before we hit it, there is one in there that's a non-lift for protocol, uh, and that is increasing the PIP22 ceiling. Right. Um, that, I think, might be the answer here. And the, the trend of why I say that is for PIP22, if you looked at the validator cutoff threshold, even after the validator uh, rev share was increased to 5%, that bounced somewhere between like 15.1 and 16k pocked with the minimum stake being 15k pocked um, the second the the ceiling made it so that you could stack up to four um nodes uh through pip 22 for servicer rewards what you saw is that that validator floor went from um it's uh, that that fifteen point one thousand up to sixty one thousand. Right. So we, I'd have to go and pull the historic numbers of how much more capital ended up backing the validator pool. But in my opinion, the fact that we have so much capital outside the validator pool is because we don't make it economically feasible to service and have enough capital locked up to be an effective validator as well. And I think that is what's creating this kind of perverse spread where people who want service or rewards are spreading horizontally. They're, they're sending out stake on the network. But that stake isn't doing anything to help protect the rewards they're earning. Uh, and I, like it, that's not, it's, that's just something important to pay attention to, I think, is that there's a big impact from just only having servicers out there and um, that big impact is that it makes the chain cheaper and cheaper to uh, overtake and essentially kind of wipe those rewards on them. So uh, I, I, the the hard part about this is going to be convincing no runners to make any changes around PIP22, given how uh, given how rocky that proposal has been. I I do agree. It's the it's the easiest quote unquote solution though. Yeah. It, from a technical perspective, it's implemented. It's the agreeing on the The question the is the question is, is it harder to build a whole bunch of features in the protocol or is it harder to push it forward with the yeah? Are there different, <laughs> there are different difficulties. Mm hmm Different challenges. Well, I will bring, I mean, this is recorded, but I'll bring this feedback to Pocket Blade as well and to get, get his thoughts too, um, you know, um, about, I mean, if he feels that the increasing of PIP22 as a node runner is right, I would love to know his his thoughts and reasoning there that could help strengthen any sort and smooth over any concerns in a governance proposal. So noted. I can also, uh, within the week, pull that, that change of data there of, of how the size of the validator pool uh, grew after multiplying that essentially minimum, not what I'll call viable stake number for a node that if you want to service viable stake for you only goes up to 60K before it only really went up to 15K. I think it would be helpful to look at what the, what the growth of the validator pool was uh, yeah. from essentially multiplying that by four and to see, hey, can we can we get this to grow even more by maybe multiplying it by another four? Yeah, I mean, this is like fairly anecdotal. Um, thanks for calling that out. I meant to, meant to say, yeah, we should definitely pull that data because from what I've been seeing, like I saw more validator dominance before PIP22. And now when I look at like the pie chart breakdown, there's more 
service uh, uh, domains in there than I had seen pr previously. Yeah, yeah, and the so it, it's not just the an important. I'd have to look at the pie chart. An important clarity here is that um, servicers, the number of unique service addresses is what kind of controls that service decentralization. But mm -hmm. the decentralization of the validator pool actually is total controlled capital by that um, essentially service domain. So right. we're, we're playing two different balancing games with two different groups of nodes here, and they're actually kind of running together at the boundary. So Interesting. I'm going to drop you a link to, I think this is what Pocket Blade had seen as well, that kind of made him start thinking about this. I just dropped it in the uh, voice channel chat. So you can see that um, zplabs.net popped up with 20.4% of validator control. And then you look around at the pie chart and there are much smaller percentages. Like, um, where is it? Node fleet right now is 3.1%. But if you look back at these pie charts, like going back like two months, there was a point where node fleet was like 40%, like a really, really high percentage. Another interesting thing is that Coder represents 4% of this validator pool, but yet if you were to look at total stake on the network, Coder represents close to 20%. Interesting. So there's, there's the, the problem here is how do we make it so that the capital that's locked up in state uh, servicers is also able to protect the network. Um, and I think that was the goal of the the delegation is that your servicers could delegate their stake to a, a validator and then delegating that stake, those servicers would get a, a small per portion of the block proposal rewards, making right. it so that your servicers could essentially just run a single update stake transaction with an additional field, and then they're getting block proposal rewards for doing that. Um, sure. The, the question is, if 22 hasn't necessarily forced consolidation like people expected. And so if we're hoping on market force consolidation, can we trust like the game theory mechanisms to actually accomplish it? Or are we going to maybe look to what is actually going to get um, kind of tokenomic security on that validator uh, set? That's yeah, it's a, definitely an interesting crossroads, especially with, like you said, the PIP 22 changes being so simple. And then what we're, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, with the servers just being able to protect the network, um, delegating the stake to specific validators, getting a percentage of those rewards being a much, much, much bigger lift. Um, that, as I, as I explain it out loud, the lift here might just only be updating the stake transaction for a node to have an additional additional field that the I think the the harder question to ask is what is the impact of what's the impact to the state of essentially your storage and memory bandwidth from from adding this on um, I don't think like the operational mm -hmm. lift might be as big as it seems it's just do we want to have this weird, this kind of state, this delegation model would not nicely map into a V1 world is the, is the thing there. But at the same time, even if it doesn't map into a V1 world, we're not going to get to a V1 world if there's a chain takeover. Sure. Sure. And um, when Ol Shansi was talking before about V1 having an unlimited amount of validators, like from your point of view, is that the right solution or is it still the problem doesn't exist um if we just could, doesn't exist at that point. if if we were operating under the old pocket which before we got super big that we decided to split services and validators and every servicer had to validate then um this problem wouldn't exist that makes sense okay so yeah i mean as as always guys it's going to be uh looking at the scope and kind of deciding the trade-offs between what we effort we put into getting v1 out the door versus how critical of a security threat this is
to be zero? And what is the right way to resolve that? Okay. We only have seven minutes left. Um, and thank you so much, Joe, for, for, all of, for, for all of that helpful context. I don't know if everyone else needed it, but I did. Um, there is a second RFP that uh, Pocket Blade has put out. Um, do we want to try to get into that a little bit in the time we have left? Or should we save that for next week? Which RFP in specific? Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me share that one. Yeah. So it's um allowing for a configurable session block height tolerance. Oh, that's so, that's a that's a big one. Um, okay. We'll yeah, we'll that, keep it on the agenda for next week. Yep. Yeah, that's um that's something that I know internally we're also having discussions about of what um potentially could be done gateway side um or what might have to be done protocol side here. So it's yeah, this is a this is a slightly bigger, more difficult topic than it might seem. So, yeah, Louise and I were talking about um, block height this this morning. But, you know, long story short, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done before I think we could implement something like this. But um, I will share the proposal out here in the uh, chat, though. Um, and next week, too, um, when I get the agenda items, if they have RFPs or other documents attached to them, I'll share them in the uh, core dev channel ahead of time so we all can have those same context and be on the same page. Is there anything else that anyone wants to bring up or discuss in the last five minutes? Nothing? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Um, got a few kind of uh, takeaways here just to uh, quickly summarize. Um, we're going, to, I'm going to follow up with Andrew to get more information um, about how we store proofs. Um, I'm also going to talk to him um, about, do, 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 sorry, uh, 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 getting some more historical context on chain halts um, from Otto and Irving. Um, and then we also want to start talking about the priority of the relay uh, endpoint. Um, Joe is going to connect with Addison, um, get some more specific information about where he saw um, this in the code. Uh, we'll start talking about a scope or a spec. And then I will talk to Otto about the kind of timeline um, and prioritization of that. And uh, then, oh, there's also a presentation that Olshansky had done around uh, the underlying cryptography of proof and claims. Um, I will track that down. I'll share that in the main channel so everyone has access to it and possibly set up a folder of resources for us. We've had um, a general kind of conversation about, um, you know, communication, transparency, hopefully as we improve these core contributor hours moving forward, um, that will, will be beneficial for all of us. Um, and then we want to continue talking. I will follow up with Pocket Blade about the discussion we had about the validator delegation um, and these two kind of paths that we were exploring there. And we will table this conversation about the block uh, configuring the block height until next week when hopefully Pocket Blade can join us. I don't know. If, I don't think I'm missing anything. I think that's it. Oh yeah, Joe, and you're gonna get that data about the validator pool growth awesome all right guys well that's it um i will talk to you all next week and feel free to reach out on discord in the meantime thank you for your time thank, thank you. you thank you all bye everyone bye, -bye.